Welcome back to Movies TV Mag. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mag, on Instagram at Movies TV Mag Triple Five, and on TikTok, of course, at Movies TV Mag Triple X. Welcome to Friday's edition. Yes, Friday already. Friday's edition of the DC EU Daily. Now, who remembers the DC rebirth thing happening within DC comics and graphic novels? So what they did, they had the New 52. Now the New 52 literally got rid of all the history of the comics and did its own thing and it was kind of very divisive. Some people loved it, some people hated it. What's been interesting about the DCEU, it's really adapted several elements of um, the New 52. And that's because Jeff Johns had a lot of say on what was going on. But you look at Lex Luthor, in BVS, that was inspired from the New 52. Now, I don't know if that was down to Zack Snyder, Chris Terrio, or Jeff Johns. I remember Jeff Johns talking about that, and it seemed like a Jeff Johns decision. Very interesting. Anyway, I was reading an interview with Leslie Grace, who's playing Batgirl on the HBO Max movie, and she was saying certain interesting things, and it got me to thinking. She, I mean, she was asked about J.K. Simmons, um, is he going to play her father? Is he going to play Jim Golden? And she goes, and she was saying stuff, please, you've taught me so much about acting, please be my dad. It doesn't sound like she knows who her dad is, or maybe she does and she's not saying. But it's very interesting to me because we've always, we hear all these announcements for all these new projects, Blue Beetle, Batgirl, and they came on saying these, these things, these projects will be based in the DCEU Earth 1. But everyone's forgetting, by the time these projects actually are released, we would have had Flashpoint. Now, I said a long time ago, and I'm sure you lot have forgotten by now, that I believe Flashpoint will enact DC Rebirth, because he does Flashpoint in the film. We know that. We know everything changes in, his, in this weird kind of earth he's created, because he's changed things by, you know, saving his mother's life. But... Obviously, like in, in, in the um, graphic novel, he has to put everything back, and things are slightly different when he does. Now, what if when Barry tries to fix things, he, he creates a DC Rebirth, a live-action version of DC Rebirth? Now, in DC Rebirth, things were a bit different than the New 52, because with the New 52, everyone forgotten, forgot everything that happened before. But with DC Rebirth, if I remember rightly, now you've got to remember, and I'm sure most of you who have been following me, subscribed to me and watching my videos for a while, know my knowledge of the comics isn't great. But I do watch a lot of DC experts, content creators on YouTube say a lot of stuff, and that's how I know just a little bit about DC Rebirth. So I may get a few things wrong about it. From what I know of DC Rebirth, it was a reboot after the New 52, bringing back the original history, you know, from 1938 and onwards. So everything was canon again. So, and this is interesting. So what if Leslie Grace's Batgirl isn't in the DCEU Earth 1 that we know, but is actually part of Matt Reeves the Batman? And her Batman is actually Robert Pattinson. Her father is the Jim Gordon from the Reeves the Batman Earth which i said to you so many times, I believe, will be the new central Earth for the DCEU and will become the DCEU Earth 1. This makes a lot of sense if you look, if you look at Leslie Grace as an actress, her appearance, it would make more sense that she was actually that actor who's playing Jim Gordon in The Batman rather than J.K. Simmons, if you ask me. J.K. Simmons is pretty old now, right? How old is J.K. Simmons? In his late 60s, 70s? He would have to be. I mean, he looks in great shape. Now, there have been rumours that J.K. Simmons would be in that movie, but we haven't heard anything about it. So I could be wrong about this, but I've just got a sneaky suspicion that actually Batgirl is related to the Jim Gordon from the Matt Reeves Batman Earth rather than the Earth One we know and some of us love, a few of us love, right? And so we go back to my DC live action, DC rebirth theory. This would make a lot, a lot of sense. So 
DC Rebirth brings back all the history, as I've already said. So there's a good chance here that they're not deleting everything. I don't know how they're going to do it. Because I've never read DC Rebirth, any comic, any graphic novel from DC Rebirth. If you know about DC Rebirth, please comment down below and give me a little bit of educating. If you find I've made a mistake about DC Rebirth in anything I've said, I'm quite happy to be respectfully and constructively um, corrected, which is cool, by the way, because this is really a theory video. Leslie Grace also said that Batman's going to be busy during Batgirl. Now, this doesn't surprise me. We are in the 21st century. We are in 2021, but by the time that's released, we're looking at 2022 or 2023, whenever. I don't know the release date, and I don't think that's been announced yet. Again, correct me if I'm wrong down in the comments below. Doesn't surprise me that Batman won't be involved. We wouldn't want the, you know, the feminine hero, you know, to be kind of outshone by the iconic male, would we now? Listen, it's a Batgirl movie, I understand. But it would have been kind of cool if Batman's involved, and maybe he will be. Whoever her Batman is, again, we were assuming it was Ben Affleck's Batman, but it could be Robert Pattinson's Batman. So this is what she had to say, even asking Margot Robbie if she's interested in playing Harley Quinn in the Batgirl movie, because someone said, um, you know, Margot was very excited about the casting. Anyway... And so, if we're going to do DC Rebirth, and, and again, this is very interesting, it makes things a lot more, well, huger, because what's going to happen in the Flash movie kind of changes a lot of things. You know, what's canon, what's not canon, how is it going to look? DC Rebirth, as we've just mentioned, makes everything canon again. Maybe DC Rebirth makes the whole multiverse canon, which is what I've always assumed they were going to do, and I, I always say that to you guys on these videos every day. So it could be that DC Rebirth not only makes the Snyderverse canon, and obviously that's what started the DCEU, and everything else we've seen thus far, but also make the Christopher Reeves Superman universe canon. Um, make, you know, you know, obviously Brandon Ralph is the Christopher Reeve version of Superman. You know, make Arrowverse canon. The whole of the multiverse, all these DC live action iterations, just makes them all canon. This would make sense with what DC Rebirth actually did in the comics. Now, I would be absolutely sold on this because I think it just gives the universe and the franchise a lot more potential. Because like it or not, and you know, I loved Arrowverse when it first started. But obviously I'm not a fan of it anymore, but there are fans of it. It would bring more butts in seats and more of an interest. And obviously the Smallville universe, it could make that canon as well. It could obviously make Tim Burton's Earth canon as well. You know, everything that's ever been d done in live action, including George Reeves' universe. I mean, obviously everyone who was in that is now dead, I would assume, I think so. Um, yes, I think, uh, what's his name, Larson, who played Jimmy Olsen, he died a few years ago as well. He was a great guy. He cameoed in, uh, not in Man of Steel, um, Superman Returns. So everything would be canon. This means you have a roadhouse to choose from. You can pick and choose any of these live action um, DC iterations, past and present. It makes the Doom Patrol universe um, canon, the Titans universe canon. I'm not even sure if Titans and Doom Patrol are actually on the same Earth because the Doom Patrol we saw in the Titans season one, I think, weren't played by the same people, if I remember rightly, as they are in, in, in the TV show. That was always very odd to me, but, you know, the cast we've got here are pretty awesome. I love Doom Patrol. I think it's one of the best DC shows ever made. It's probably one of the only ones that can compete with Smallville. Thus far in its first two seasons, it's been very consistent, as Smallville was for 10 seasons. And I'll finish off this video having a Smallville rant, even though this is a DCEU Daily. Sometimes at the end of the DCEU Daily, we will have a non-DCEU Daily subject matter. Because the DCEU obviously is everything starting from Man of Steel and James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. That's the most recent movie and all the movies in the mid middle. That's what the DCEU is. You're not stupid. I'm sure you know that. Just, just explaining it to you. So it's pretty obvious that they've seen the potential 
of making all these live action iterations, past and present, part of the same universe. Now, they'll still be on separate Earths, but they could say somehow something, the walls have broken down of the multiverse. That's what they're doing on the MCU, um, which is very exciting. So this just gives you a potential to cross anything over with anything else. So it's always been my suspicion that we were always heading towards a DC Rebirth live action version. And I'm, I'm actually very tempted to read those comics. So I can actually understand what it's all about. Now they may not be trying to actually copy and paste the graphic novels of DC Rebirth. I, I'm sure they could use a, f a few in a few movies. What, what I think is what they will attempt to do is use the concept of how they rebooted the whole universe as DC Rebirth and all the history of the comics from 1938 Action Comics number one is canon. As I said, the New 52, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know everything. I know very little about the comics, even though I'm a huge DC superhero fan. I respect, you know, the comics as the thing. You know, without the comics, there's no live action. I respect the comics. I just don't have the concentration to read them all, unfortunately. I've read a few, don't get me wrong, but I just don't have the time or inclination to read, read them as a habit, which is a shame, and I think that's my loss. So if they do this, this will be a huge change to the DCEU, and it will be so different. And it will be very, very interesting if they do this. And so we will keep our attention on DC fandom. Now, I don't expect them to give us too many clues about what's going to happen in The Flash and how it's all going to be rebooted. You'll probably find they repeat a lot of things they said last year because they don't want to give too many things away. So what do you think? Do you think I'm right? Do you think that we are getting a live action version of DC Rebirth? Personally, I hope so, because this would be the best way to deal with the situation they have right now. Now, with our conversation about maybe Flashpoint enacting a DC Rebirth, a couple of days ago, Chris Wong Svensson from Ping Pong Flicks made a very interesting video. Now, his theory is that they could be enacting the storyboards written and drawn by Jim Lee, Jeff Johns and Zack Snyder. Now, if you remember, just before they released Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut, they released these storyboards in some kind of museum. I know AT&T did it. So that was very interesting as well. But on these storyboards was um, the Legion of Doom. Because don't forget that at the end of Justice League, there was a hint towards the Legion of Doom with Lex saying, I think it's time we started our own team, if you remember. So if Justice League was a success, they would have went along with those plans. But maybe they never gave up on those plans. Maybe it was Snyder's original plan to do a Legion of Doom. But we actually know, don't we, that the Legion of Doom was going to show up in Justice League 2 and Justice League 3. So that was always going to happen. I'm not sure if it, I think it's in the nightmare future. If I remember rightly, again, you can correct me in the comments down below because I'm not right. I'm just kind of, you know, trying to remember things because I forget things very easily. I am getting old. Anyway, so it could be that they are still doing the Legion of Doom storyline. Now, we've seen a picture of Orm with um, long hair and a very long beard. Now, in um, I think in Justice League 2, or at least in the storyboards, they had Orm as part of the Legion of Doom. Lex Luthor goes around collecting villains to start this team. Now, now what Chris is trying to kind of infer that what happens is that they are doing this, they're doing this Legion and Doom arc in Aquaman, partially. So this would be very interesting. So could Lex Luthor have broken Orm out of his um, Atlantean prison? That would be very exciting, wouldn't it? Now, who would be playing Lex Luthor? Because is Jesse Eisenberg going to be Lex Luthor after Flashpoint? Because Aquaman is the very next project after Flashpoint. After, you know, this whole universe is rebooted and is franchised. So, let's say Lex Luthor does break Orm out of jail. And he brings, you know, Black Manta along for the ride as well. Which I think is part of the storyboards as well. I'm not sure. Now, don't forget... Black Manta wasn't in prison at the end of Aquaman. He escaped. 
uh, some guy saved him. He was talking to some guy and he wanted help, help to get Aquaman, if you remember in that post credit scene. So I'm, I think Chris, Chris was trying to say that he's in prison at the end of Aquaman, but that's not how I remember it, unless I am wrong. Anyway, tomatoes, tomatoes. And so Chris believes that they're trying to continue this Legion of Doom storyline. Now, Chris went to another portion of the storyboards. Now, in the storyboards in Zack Snyder's Flash movie, I think, this is what Chris was saying, if I remember cor correctly, and I very rarely do, is in the Flash movie, on the storyboards, it was Henry Allen was finally acquitted for the murder of his wife. And so you had Iris West there, um, but you had Cyborg, Greyfisher Cyborg. Well, it doesn't look like that's going to happen with the problems between him and WB, but this is showbiz, anything is possible. And and so that's what the art and kind of the writing on the storyboard suggested, that Henry Allen was acquitted and Iris West was there, Cyborg was there, Barry Allen was there. Um, I don't think Michael Keaton's Batman was there, but he is obviously in this film. We've even seen some leaked footage of that. And so that's a very interesting thing as well. So Chris has a little theory and I think it's very, it's a very thin theory, if you ask me, but you never know. Because there are some coincidences here, especially with Orm having long hair and a beard. Has he escaped? Has Lex Luthor broken him out? We just don't know. But it does, it is very interesting because if they are actually working off of Zach's and Jim's and Jeff's storyboards, this is the plan that Zack Snyder was going to shoot, partially. So, Zach even admitted the storyboards would have to change because of what's happened thus far and how things have changed in the other movies as well. But Zach could have still done that. So, are they going to do this without Zack Snyder and continue the concepts of this storyboard? It could be, a, I mean, it's a small possibility, but it could be a, a, a good possibility because the Legion of Doom is actually a very, very good concept and very exciting. The only problem with all of this is, I'd never thought that Warner Brothers going forward would fancy Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. But the reboot could just change the actor. And, you know, the Legion of Doom arc could still happen. Now, this is all very interesting, isn't it? Considering it was Justice League that teased this and not Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut. So, uh, yeah, uh, very, very interesting, and we'll have to see what happens in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. But it's a great theory from Chris Wong's Fenson, so thank you for that, Chris. I was very excited watching your video the other day, and it really got me hyped. And our final little DCEU update for today is the actor who's playing Black Manta, who played Black Manta in Aquaman and now Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, was asked something, so we're just going to look at his, um, at his reply. Then you have Aquaman 2. He was answering questions about the Matrix as well. This guy is going from strength to strength. Then you have Aquaman 2. What's the biggest difference playing Black Man to now that it's been a few years? Now we have a character who's more mature, who has more time to bring, and we get to understand him and some of his values and some of his motives, hopefully in Aquaman 2, we can present a more rounded version of David Kane. In the first film, we sort of got to meet him, but mostly it was about Black Manta. And this one, my hope is that we can meet David Kane a bit more and find out what makes him tick and some of the things that he wants and struggles with. So very, very interesting. So by the sounds of this, he doesn't like the fact that he's in the costume, but that costume is fucking awesome, mate. So I don't want to see a situation where we're just seeing the man and we're not seeing the Black Manta because that would really piss me off. Now, if there's a balance to this and we can see him out of the costume as much as we see him in the costume and they give him some goddamn, you know, character development, that's very, very good and I would like that. But I don't want to see more, what's his name, David Kane or whatever, David Kane rather than Black Manta. If there's a balance and we can see as much of both of the kind of the identities of this character, I'd be very, very happy about that. But yeah, you know, Black Manta is the thing that I really want to see. Everyone wants to see more Black Manta. But yeah, by all means, give him some character development. I'm fine with that. 
And finally today, as promised, this is my non-DCEU portion of the video, and we're going to talk about Smallville. Now you know I'm a huge Smallville fan, I think it's the best comic book television show ever made. Its consistency was unique, what they were able to do with Clark and Lex and the Kents, you know, and the Luthers and Chloe, and all of these characters were sensational. You know, this, I don't think any live action version of Superman was able to do so much good stuff with this character and his other iconic supporting characters, but there was always an issue with Tom Welling and playing this character. I mean, at first he turned this character down and um, then he read the script and he liked it. I think he liked the fact he wouldn't be wearing a costume. And it was Tom's opinion that Clark should never wear the Superman costume in every, any episode of Smallville. I've always said, as long as the show was active and recommissioned for more seasons, I agreed with that. But in the finale, he should have always suited up and I'm not talking about the awful CGI we saw in the series finale. I mean, Smallville's not the only problematic series finale, and we all know that. Now, there was a big issue with Tom as we came up to his renewal of his final contract. They all knew this would be the final contract. This was the big one. So, a lot of kind of variables were going on just before he started negotiations. Our Miles wanted to finish the show with season seven. But the Writers Guild strike stopped all of that. And that was a big disappointment, I think, for our Miles and for me. Because, yes, we would have lost the extra three seasons, but our Miles would have finished it their way, the creators of the show, the ones who had the vision. And they would have done it the right way. And pre his final contract, they would have forced him to put the costume on, at least in that finale. What went down afterwards with his next deal was the huge problem. So I remember Kelly and Brian, who were running the show after Al Miles left and had been writing the show actually since season two, telling us that there was a possibility at the moment that, you know, he hasn't negotiated, he is negotiating his deal, but he hasn't signed anything. And they even said they'd have to call the show a different name if he left, AKA a Smallville spin-off. Now that would have been quite interesting as well because he hadn't signed a new deal yet and if he was about to do his last year, which would, would have been season eight, then he would have had to wear the costume again. In fact, this could have been a good thing, finishing his story off in the right way. So what did Tom want to sign his next deal? Well, Tom wanted to be a producer on Smallville. He, he wanted a producer's credit on another brand new show. So they, what happened once he signed that deal was, he got to produce a show called Hellcats. He really didn't do anything, although he was pretending he was working on it as well. But he was a producer on this show that lasted one season, no surprise, called Hellcats. Then it was Axe. You're not a very good producer, are you, Tom? But there was another stipulation that I've been told, you know, allegedly, take it with a pinch of salt, that he put in his new contract that he would never wear the Superman costume. This is how passionate this guy was. And I said at the time, you know, people have been wearing costumes when they've been performing and acting and pretending since William Shakespeare's day. And for this guy to say, I'm not putting on this costume was ridiculous. Now, I never understood if it was because of the, he wanted the piece to remain like it was. If he, if, he, if he was passionate about Smallville being Smallville and never making it superhero-y, but it always was superhero-y. As well as, especially in the final years when they put their own Justice League together. Everyone else but Clark was wearing a fucking costume. Ridiculous. Again, I, w I didn't understand the logic of him ever dressing up as Superman before the series finale, because this was a pre-Superman story. So that's fine. I understand that. I like what they did with season nine when he wore the dark Neo coat and a little top with the Superman insignia on it. Pretty cool, because it was, he was in a dark place. So that was awesome, and I like that. So I don't understand if his refusal was a narr for narrative reasons to wear the costume, or if it was because he thought, felt embarrassed to wear the costume, he thought it would ruin his career. I never really understand. So his final deal was the key issue. The key issue was that he didn't want to wear that costume. And now that he was a producer, he would have more of a say how Smallville ended up. He had more of a say, Alison Mack, who played Chloe, had more of a say how her character's story would end up, and that became problematic, as you saw. 
Her ending made no sense. You know, the whole reading a Superman comic to the kid, it was lame, that was her ending. Pretty much kind of her and Oliver having a kid who may or may not be Connor Hawk, for crying out loud. I mean, look, I understand, at the time we didn't really think about Smallville as an Elseworlds story, but obviously, Smallville was an Elseworlds story. So we were kind of desperate for things to line up with the comics, the other Superman movies. But ultimately, Smallville could do things as differently as they wanted because it was a multiverse story. It was an Elseworlds story. That's pretty obvious. And by bringing other people from other Superman live-action iterations into it, that's definitely a multiversal story. It makes it more of a multiversal story as well, especially Christopher Reeve as Dr. Virgil Swan. The differences of it make sense. So I was always comfortable with Smallville being an Elseworlds story on another Earth, not the central Earth. That's absolutely fine. The problem with the, se <clears throat> the, problem with the series finale is it's a series finale for the final three seasons and it's not a series finale for the whole ten seasons, although they do bring back Lex and Rosenbaum did not want to come back, but he realised his fans could turn on him and he wouldn't have support for the rest of his career if he didn't. So he was in a new win, no, no win scenario. He never wanted to come back, but he felt he had to. Now that scene in the burnt out Luther mansion was beautiful. Now Rosenbaum's scene with, um, what's her name, Cassidy Freeman, aka Tess Mercer, didn't work for me. I didn't feel like these two characters had any history, which they were supposed to. She was Lex's sister. I hate the mind wipe thing. I really hate the mind wipe thing. Because they decided again that Lex shouldn't know Clark is Superman, or who he is, or that he's a Kryptonian. But you could have easily spun it like that. Because as I say, it was obviously an Elseworld story anyway. So, and it's kind of weird. It's okay for Lois to know, but it's not alright for Lex to know. Bullshit. So, and the whole thing is, the stuff, the serum she gives him, pretty much means he wouldn't even know how to go to the toilet, how to walk, anything. I think he's standing up when he's looking outside the window at the end there. So, this never made sense. Now, don't get me started how they stupidly killed him off and then brought him back as another clone with all the previous Lex's memories. I thought that was lame too. Why did you kill him off? He should have been in the background pulling the strings. So, once our miles left, it lost a lot of legitimacy. But, in places, it was still a great show. You had great episodes like Bright. You know, um, Absolute Justice, Legion. You know, these were good things. So, our, um, so not our miles, but Kelly and Brian did do some good stuff. But unfortunately, they were being hampered by the studio. And obviously, the CW were a big problem. And that's what drove our miles out of the show. I mean, they'd only just, I think only a few years ago, finished the kind of the legal battles with the, with the network. And so, that's why they had to leave. Ultimately, Smallville in its ending, had the same similar issues to Game of Thrones. What I always found was very interesting, after the series finale of Smallville, that I seemed to be one of the few people that wasn't happy. Now, my stance has always been that, yeah, he should have wore the costume in the finale, but that wasn't my huger issue. My huger issue is that they wasted the double finale on a wedding that didn't happen. And... It was obvious that they spent all their budget on the planet Apocalypse coming towards Earth. It's a great effect, so when you actually see Superman flying like a little dot, as we do, it looks like some fans done a YouTube video. It looked very, very bad. And then we get Clark's best bits, which is kind of emotional, but, you know, then you've got, you know, um, Darth, uh, Dark Side, you know, what's his name? Uh, Lionel Luthor versus Dark Side. I used to have a nickname for that and I can't remember it now. But yeah, they decided to do this kind of um, dark side but have him as Lionel. He takes Lionel's soul, Lionel's body, and kind of Lionel makes a deal with dark side to bring Lex back to life or one of the clones. So that's the whole idea of the story. So you have Lionel Luther, and it's not John Glover's voice, it's just his face and his body, but he's got this dark side, you know, really evil voice. They don't really fight. And in the end, Clark, when he comes out of his best bits, is revigorated and just pushes him. And that's it, and he just disappears in a puff of smoke. <sighs> and then you get this sequence, him as Superman, lifting up Apocalypse and basically taking it or pushing it back where it's supposed to be. 
obviously you don't see, you never see Welling's face in the costume. Never. The only thing you get at the end is when he pulls the shirt open, but you don't see his head. You just see the S shield. So it's clear to me Welling never wanted a full picture of us to see him as Superman, which was very, very odd in the end and highly disappointing. So I feel that Tom Welling betrayed us. I, re I really do feel passionate about that. Now, you can't force people to do what they don't want to do, but ultimately, that's what happened. Now, it wasn't bad enough that he betrayed us over that. He came back to Arrowverse to do it all over again. Him and Greg Belanti decided that Clark, in the kind of years that we haven't seen him, had decided to put blue, a blue kryptonite ring on his finger, which blue kryptonite means you have, you're not a Kryptonian, basically. You're human, and you don't have your abilities. That's what Clark decides to do. Apparently, this is so he can stay at home and look after the kids and be with Lois. And I think this is the dumbest thing ever. And the way they got Tom to act as Clark in Crisis on Infinite Earths was so unlike Clark. He didn't seem to really understand what was going on with Crisis or, or even understand the term multiverse. It was all very rushed and very weird. Now... If you remember rightly, Michael Rosenbaum was given the same offer as Tom Welling to return for Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, Michael's, Michael's problem with the whole thing, the conjecture that Michael had with it was, he wasn't told how much he'd be earning. He, wouldn't, he wasn't being told what the story was, obviously, so it wouldn't leak out. Or, so Michael couldn't say no, because obviously, as bad as Tom's Clark Kent story is, I'm sure Michael Rosenbaum's Lex Luthor wouldn't have been written well by these people. I think ultimately Michael understood. I'm sure Tom told him what he was going to be doing on it and Michael probably thought, nah, I'm not doing this. Michael understands that the highlight of his career is playing Lex Luthor. He doesn't really act anymore. He's mostly doing his podcast inside of you. So he understood the highlight of his career, the legacy of the way he played that character, the way it was written and developed and conceived by our Miles would be destroyed by Belanti, and Michael made the logical choice not to be involved. Now, hopefully one day we can see Michael again, maybe in the flash, because he is the greatest Lex Luthor. I don't think you can even debate that or argue that, or maybe you can. Maybe you'll do it in the comments down below. I'll give it a check later. I do check my comments, by the way. So, if there was a betrayal. Now, how do I feel about Tom Welling's kind of role in crisis and Clark Kent? And do I think that's Smallville canon? No. I will never, ever accept what happened to Tom Welling, Smallville's Clark Kent, in Crisis on Infinite Earths. As far as I'm concerned, the last time I saw Tom Welling's Clark Kent was in the series finale of Smallville. Now, yesterday we were talking about Snyder. I was being very positive. It's interesting to me how people don't understand what it takes to be a president or the president of DC Films. So there was a little debate between me and somebody else and the whole thing was what Walter Hamada was responsible for. Now if you go back to the end of Aquaman, the credits, you'll see um, executive producer Walter Hamada as he is on every film from Aquaman. That's Aquaman, Shazam, Joker, Birds of Prey, Wonder Woman 84 and James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. He's literally been executive producer on six movies. Now, there's conjecture from the Snyderverse fandom, because obviously Aquaman made over a billion dollars, it's the most successful movie, they seem to believe that Zack Snyder had a lot to do with Aquaman. Now, I've always said to you that he had a lot to do with Wonder Woman 2017, and I thought it's his vision, and more his movie than Patty Jenkins. That's why she got as far away from that film as possible. It makes logical sense. But in terms of what they've heard about Aquaman, like, you know, James Wan going, you know, consulting with Snyder, well, he would do, wouldn't it? Because he was running the universe recently. I mean, it's only during Justice League that Snyder really isn't physically involved with the DCEU anymore. So obviously, it was Snyder who cast Momoa, who had the vision of Momoa, so you'd expect him to consult him. And he may have done that out of respect, but apparently he showed the film to Snyder even though he wasn't allowed to. He wanted Snyder's permission, which is very interesting and really good of James Wan. But, ultimately, it was the beginning of James Wan's... No, sorry, say that again. It was the beginning of the Walter Hamada 
you know, presidential era of DC Comics. Sounds very official, doesn't it? But, but it was. So he was involved with Aquaman and the changes were made. So very, very interesting. I think, again, Aquaman is an interesting film because normally when too many cooks are in there, they spoil the broth. Now, then there was a discussion with me and this commenter that he was had nothing to do with Joker. Now, the uh, kind of justification for this is that Warner Brothers and Hamada had doubts over Joker, which we've discussed on this channel many a time. And he was obviously criticising Hamada for having the doubts, getting, you know, sponsorship partners in. But this is what I mean. You either understand how the industry works and how the studio system works, or you don't. You'll be surprised how many superhero films out there there is that brought in, you know, separate investors. And I've explained it before. They've been burnt with an altar already. They didn't want to be burnt again. But they, were, they obviously believed in the project enough to let it happen. And that's what you lot don't mention. And Hamada is a producer on that as well. He was the one who brought the film on such a low budget. Then this person goes, well, Shazam's only successful because it was made on a low budget. There has no logic to that argument whatsoever. That film still could have been a flop. But it cost under 100 million to make. But, again, as I've said a million times, and it doesn't matter what you say to me in the comments down below, that film was enjoyed by families and children. Now, it didn't make a great deal of money. But the other thing he said to me was, well, why didn't it make more money? Why hasn't Ant-Man made more money? Why are the Ant-Man movies the lowest grossing films in the MCU? Pre-Shang-Chi. Because there's not much, there's much interest in those characters. That's why. And that's fine. This is a lower grade character. That's why. I am sick and tired of this propaganda. I don't mind people being passionate about Snyder's universe. I'm passionate about his universe. And as you know, I'd love to restore the Snyderverse. But when we start using lies and misinformation, this is when the problems begin. This has been the DCEU Daily here on Movies TV Mad. I'm Mick, your host with the most. Just ask your girlfriends and your wives. And I will see you again on the next video. Please like, comment, share and subscribe. The views for my videos recently have been so low. The likes are not bad, about four or five. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but for me, that's a lot. But again, if you don't get the notifications, please search for the videos daily. If you like me, even if you don't like the videos, just smash the like button so a few people can notice them. But I'm sure some of you at least like the videos or you wouldn't be coming back every day. So I will see you again on Saturday's edition of the DCEU Daily. Until then, goodbye.